Okay, everyone, welcome to another episode of Raising the Bar with myself, John Cooper. And today I'm joined by Emmanuel Pastry, who serves as the president of the Asia Institute and is director general of the Institute for Future Urban Environments. He declared his candidacy for president of the US as an independent in February of 2020. Emmanuel, welcome to the show. It's an honor to be with you. Would it be okay? I gave you a little bio there, but could you explain to the audience um, what brought you to where you are at the moment and running for candidacy of president and also, you know, being brave enough to speak the truths that you do? Right. Well, I, I, I'm an American and I guess you would say uh, not only that, I was a card carrying member of the establishment in the sense that, I mean, my father went to Yale, I went to Yale. I grew up in a sort of upper middle class environment and became a professor at University of Illinois uh, and uh, was in some ways at the beginning, this is 22 years ago, a uh, rather uh, prominent figure in Asian studies and thought I would end up with a very illustrious career. Uh, but then I was forced by the 9-11 and the build up to 9-11 to face certain ugly aspects of American culture. In some, in some respects, it was a change, uh, a negative uh, mutation in American culture. Uh, and I saw people being cleared out of government, out of academics and other, other places. And I felt we sort of crossed the Rubicon, that as an intellectual, I had a responsibility to take a stand uh, and oppose uh, what not just myself, but a small group in America, of people who felt we had to take a stand back then in 2001, even before the 9-11 incident. It went back to Oklahoma. It went back to the Kennedy assassination. In some respects, it went back to the end of the Second World War uh, when we had this very sad experience. Uh, and it's true for, it's equally true in London as it is in Washington, D.C., which is that in the Second World War, there was an effort in the United States, in DC or in, 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 in London to sort of move away from this imperialist financial system and get back to something closer to a republic uh, and something based upon uh, representation, the interests and, and the needs of the average citizen and away from global finance. And that that system it, it, it fell apart. It started to fall apart at the end of the Second World War. It took 30 years and the sort of the spider's web world in which American, uh, British corporations set up their headquarters in the, in the Virgin Islands and other places in the margins and created their own parallel alternate universe, which is not subject to the rule of law, which is not overseen by anything, uh, trusts, corporations, offshore holdings. And now that has become the dominant paradigm. So in fact, we live in our terrarium economy, you, me, our friends. And then there's this other untouchable Brahmin class, uh, which has accumulated enormous billions and billions of dollars. They make up money, they control money, and they, in basically the, the leftovers from the British empire uh, have, suddenly become the dominant mode for economic uh, interaction uh, for both the United States uh, and Great Britain and, uh, and other countries as well. And we've signed basically, unbeknownst to ourselves, a sort of death pact uh, to have our societies torn apart, sold off uh, at, fireside, at, at fire sale prices uh, to benefit this tiny handful of the super rich now it's of course no longer London and 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 uh, New York. It's not no longer Wall Street in London, but includes wealthy individuals from around the world, from Japan, from Germany, from China, from Russia, etc. Uh, but it's it's a very very disturbing world, uh, and so I decided we had to take a stand, not just me. Uh, and the results were I ended up spending uh, uh, fourteen years in Korea. Uh, this is my second time trying to come back to the United States. I don't know how it will end, and I'm not totally sure that you know it, it's viable, but at least to try and say, let's go back to a politics. Politics is not a bad word originally. A politics of truth, 
a politics of ethical uh, commitment and to say that those of us who had the benefit of receiving good educations, uh, that our responsibility uh, lies with the with the common the common man, the common woman, the working woman and man of our country, uh, of our earth, uh, and not our interests do not lie uh, with the billionaires, with Goldman Sachs and uh, BlackRock. Uh, and this may seem obvious to some of you, but in fact, that this is not common sense in London and Washington. Uh, the vast majority of privileged uh, into intellectuals, those who have had these opportunities, uh, find themselves siding with the billionaires. Uh, billionaires articulated through their, you know, false, their, their cardboard messiahs, their pay-to-play NGOs, their fake uh, organizations, which supposedly are trying to abolish poverty or fate or, um, uh, uh, um, address environmental crises, but in fact are following uh, their directives through uh, private intelligence agencies working for billionaires, for BlackRock, uh, for Microsoft, Cisco, uh, and other uh, of these. Um, I, I, they're a combination of financial, uh, technological, and intelligence organizations. Uh, for mass uh, manipulation of public opinion and essentially creating a radical class society. What do you mean by radical class? Oh, but there's a, um, so class is an issue which I think is critical for our political action and for self-awareness mm. uh, and also for creating real change. Uh, so we have to uh, be, be aware uh, that there's a there are radical class differentiations between this small group of billionaires and their immediate uh, associates uh, who live in their own uh, precious world, uh, uh, winging around on private jets, uh, for whom there has been no pandemic, there has been no economic yeah. crisis of anything, they've yeah. gotten richer uh, and they're insulated on every side. So if you grow up in one of these families, you're not even aware of, of what is going on in the world or what's happening to those uh, around you. Unfortunately, the term class has been associated with sort of Marxist thought, uh, which has led some people to sort of dismiss it. Anyone who's talking about class is obviously a leftist, a socialist, can't be taken seriously. There are two problems with that assumption. One is that socialist and Marxist analysis, although it has serious problems with it, it, is accurate in many respects and deserves to be at least explored as a one perspective on the world. And the billionaires have paid off a lot of people uh, to pursue this argument that if you're a socialist, if you're sympathetic with you know Marxist or Leninist uh, analysis, then you are the enemy. We can't even listen to anything that you say. Uh, and so we never even look at what Marx actually wrote. Um, so that's one serious part of 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 the uh, the problem that we that we face. And the other part of it is that people like you know uh, John Stuart Mills, uh, people who wrote on uh, social and political issues in the 19th century, used the word class. They used this framework for understanding the world. So the problem of the emergence of dominant classes uh, who control the control money, control the means of production and distribution uh, and education and ideology. This is not a Marxist concept, right? People like Mills were talking about it in the in the nineteenth century who were not Marxists. So somehow, by branding it as somehow socialist or Marxist, we take away from from intellectuals or from common people, this valuable form of analysis to understand the world in terms of class. Yeah, thank you for that. I think though what's happened in, in, my, uh, in my perspective is that the, it's gone from class being about the socioeconomic disparity to, to now being transposed over 
different categories such as race, sexual identity, right. sexual orientation, which is what they often refer to as neo-Marxism or cultural Marxism. Neo-Marxism. I think a lot of people have a problem with that because right. it's um it's it's another divide and conquer it feels like another divide and conquer strategy it is <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i mean i yeah. would say that what we're probably looking i mean i don't have access to all these classified files i don't know what all these private intelligence agencies yeah. and and investment banks are doing but i can guess that basically they've paid off a group of people to push this sort of neo uh um, progressive neo uh, Marxist ideology yeah. of identity politics, uh, but that that is not based on, you know, some, how would I say it? It's not a group of working people who are coming up with this, mm. but it's being force fed to us by these same groups so that the same people at BlackRock or you know at, at, at Cisco or Facebook or Google who are funding the corrupt parts of Black Lives Matter to push forward this you know gender blending uh, um, race based uh, fake ideological struggle are probably the same people who are funding you know the Trump people and their MAGA groups who are attacking immigrants as being the threat to America mm, without yes. I, without identifying. I mean, the problem with, with the Trump people, and I actually don't think they're any more right or wrong than the other side. Um, they're, they're totally right to identify that, that immigration is being used to destroy the lives of ordinary Americans. Where they're wrong or where they miss it is that they don't see that Global financial institutions are investing in Mexico and Brazil and Argentina to destroy the local economies of those countries, to force people into the United States as part of this scheme to destroy the lives of workers in both places so that they can emerge uh, sort of all powerful. And so both sides, the left and the right, have become, I mean, not all. But there, a lot of it is a puppet show these days. It seems to me that these big companies, um, they work through academia, they work through um, the education system, and they right. capture, the first people they capture are the so-called intellectuals. And it's a, right. almost a paradox to me, because it seems to me that the, the people that have abdicated their critical thinking skills are the intellectuals, whereas the kind of, your common working class people, your right. man on the street seems to be able to, um, acknowledge evil when he For sees sure. it, and 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 psyops and and things that are of the you know government um, overreach and stuff like that. But why is it? Why do you think it is that that's been the case that these intellectuals have been captured first? And why is it you think that they can't? seem to think for themselves <laughs> right well i am i came from that background yeah. uh and so i i have intimate uh, uh knowledge of this process um to some degree of course it's a standard strategy i mean you can read about it and, you, and there are probably strategy books that are being uh, uh handed around at boston consulting or uh you know other uh um uh, private and consulting firms about how do you take over a country? And so uh, seizing control, I mean, it goes back to the Phoenix pro- project in some ways, which was the, the 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 groundwork for what we see today was carried on in Vietnam uh, by the U- U.S. government and corporations uh, hiding behind government about how to take over Vietnam in the 1960s. And it, it's pretty explicit and it was basically a handbook which was later used, I mean, Doug Valentine talks about this in detail for how to run the United States. So what was tried in Vietnam in the the 1960s was then imported into the United States and seizing control of intellectuals is a big part of it. Uh, So uh, basically it's both, you know, it's the, uh, the, the carrot and stick, right? The carrot is intellectuals are flattered, they're felt to, they're made to feel like they're part of the establishment, rich people take them out to dinner, uh, treat them, you know, feature them in the media, they get to be famous in a way that they wouldn't normally, and so they're sort of led into this, this seduction. It's it's a form of seduction in a way 
uh, it eventually becomes a form of sort of sexual abuse, almost like rape, in which they become so compromised by these relationships that they themselves can no longer face the reality. They, they, they fall into a form of denial. Uh, so that's the one part. Mm. And the, the stick, of course, is punishment, which is to say that professors, intellectual I mean, professors, journalists, uh, lawyers, doctors, this class of, of the educated, more educated than the billionaires, of course, um, that they start to see their interests as being with those ties to the wealthy, and, and they know that they can be cut off. You know, they can lose their tenure, not be tenured, not get those opportunities to show up on CNN or whatever, be invited to think tanks, um, and that that, uh, that threat uh, then obviously leads them to self-censor. Uh, and we see, I mean, the most clear example was what happened. Of, I mean, this has been true, I should just add. This has been true for a while. It's gotten worse. Uh, but the the classic example was a few years ago, uh, Drew Faust, uh, American historian, uh, professor at Harvard, wrote a excellent study, several studies of the Civil War. Um, she became president of, of Harvard. Uh, and then when she retired about three years ago, um, she was invited to become a member of the uh, board of directors of Goldman Sachs. Um, now, I think that 20 years ago, it would have been inconceivable that a president of Harvard would have stepped down and become you know, join the board of directors of Goldman Sachs. Um, but Harvard has changed fundamentally in its nature. It was never perfect, uh, but whereas there was a clear wall to say Harvard would take money uh, from wealthy individuals that had an enormous uh, foundation of 30, now more than $40 billion, that there was a, a sort of a wall, sort of brain blood barrier, which said, we will keep out these parts so that Harvard will, to some degree, be able to be independent, relatively. But that this is gone now. And this is why people say that Harvard today is a is a uh, investment fund with a little university attached on the side. Mm -hmm. um, and so those $40 billion is what's important, right? Not Harvard. And or by extension, Harvard is just a brand like Adidas or you know Google, whatever, which multinational uh, corporations can use to brand their psych ops. Uh, and we see this happening increasingly as the name Harvard is used promiscuous, promiscuously to uh, mask or rebrand rather disturbing uh, activities, nor is that limited to Harvard. We see that across the board. Yeah, thank you for that. All universities, it seems at the moment, are captured to a certain degree. And it seems as though the, the students that are coming out, not I don't just mean the blue tick intellectuals, I just mean even just uni university graduates. Sure. They are the products of their professors who were probably activists at one point, you know. It seems as though that's kind of almost, it's like a kind of a follow on. It's like a knock on Very effect, true. a domino effect of the the passing down of an ideology. And I, I want to know why these students, that they, they don't seem to be encouraged how to think, they're told what to think. Right. And, they're, and they're, also whip, they're also whipped up into sort of a frenzy. It's all very kind of tribal within the universities. So right. They, right. They, they feel they're almost militarized at university with their ideologies. And then when very they true. come out, they go out, they go into media, they go out, go into HR departments of companies. And then of course, that's where it spreads. And it, is that, it, is that a fair assessment? And, and how do we, oh. how do we change that? I mean, and, and, and also if you were to, if there was someone watching this, who, who was someone who's coming through university and going through, I don't know, some kind of uh, feminist sociology course, whatever it is, you know, um, and they've got these Gender very militant studies. ideas about mm -hmm. everything. What would be what could we say to them to encourage them to break out of that that kind of ideological calcification? I don't know what you'd call it, but you know what I'm trying to say. Right. Well, it's it's a, it's an extremely difficult process, mm. uh, and I, I I personally think we're we're going to have to be 
increasingly independent that we're going to have to say that these some of these institutions are so corrupt uh they've essentially become they're not about learning and they're not about education right um the the point is that you get this degree you know high school degree or college degree or graduate degree and that allows you to get a job so it's a qualification it's not about learning how to think it's not about understanding the world it's not even about science uh but it's rather just following a set of prescribed uh, rituals that will give you a qualification that allows you to be employed. So that's not education. So I think the first step is just to be brave enough to say, this is not education, to sort of put your foot down and say, this doesn't have the legitimacy of being, edu of being a real education, and to admit to ourselves, this is the first step. As I said before, it's like rape or incest mm. um, in that the individual, the victim, is so corrupted and compromised by this process that he or she is no longer able to identify the violence and the exploitation for what it is. Mm. And so we fall into these uh, ritual ascent right, that we go along, even as these universities, even as these newspaper, I mean, journalism, education, governance, uh, that these have all become corrupt means for the super wealthy to control us. And the best way to control, as we know from the experiments at DARPA and Guantanamo Bay, et cetera, is by abuse. And to see how that could be used as a way to permanently alter the capacity of individuals to respond. Uh, this become so compromised, they can no longer oppose anything. So I think that's the ultimate goal here, is to compromise us through education, through media, in these relationships, mm -hmm. so that we can no longer stand up and say, this is wrong you know, that we have a perspective. So mm -hmm. it does come back. I mean, this is why I appreciate your efforts with this focus on the individual and sort of self-confidence, awareness, because if we don't at that base level have the ability to say, this is who I am, these are my values, this is, you know, uh, where I'm standing, my perspective, then we're going to be incapable of articulating an opposition to this outside multinational force. Absolutely. Yeah, I, that's what I believe. I believe that we need to bring everything back to to the individual themselves and to, to really take care and to nurture yourself and almost curate your own life in a way that then Absolutely. cascades outwards with your beliefs, your values and your integrity that way. You, I, I read in one of your articles or it may, may have been on a podcast, you mentioned that this hasn't always been the way. We're actually a lot more, we're much uh, more... We were critical thinkers much right. more about 60, 70 years ago. What's right. changed then? And what how did we think back then? And what was missing? Because you to, often you like to talk and reference that, you know, some philosophers and stuff like that. Right, Are there right. any sort of things that we could really do with to help us, uh, you know, with our critical, right. uh, our rational, rational faculties? Right. Well, so I there have been many changes that took place, promotion of this consumption culture. Uh, a sort of narcissism within our aesthetics, in, in our entertainment, in movies, et cetera. Uh, and uh, above all, I would say uh, the intentional confusion pushed forward basically th by multinational corporations and the rich, intentional confusion of science with technology. If we're going to look for one major factor uh, origin of the current crisis in the collapse of medicine, the collapse of journalism, collapse of academics. I think that the intentional confusion of science with technology is key. And I would just, I'd, I'd start with the, there's a, a philosopher, essayist of the 1960s, Paul Goodman, who said, Famously, 
Whether or not it draws on new scientific research, technology is a branch of moral philosophy, not of science. This is to say that technology should be ultimately concerned with the moral, the ethical, and that science is the process by which one investigates or searches for truth. And that these two uh, are fundamentally different, right? That science is a philosophical demand to discover the truth through a process. We tend to call it scientific method, which is a maybe not so helpful term. What it means essentially is you observe things around you, you speculate as to possible explanations for what you see, using your imagination. So it's it's a uh, humanistic, creative process. And then you compare the explanations that you imagine with what you observe over time, you eliminate. You start with five, you get them to four, three, and eventually you're able to come up with a thesis as to what you observe, what reality is, what truth is based upon that process, that intellectual philosophical process. That sort of science of understanding the truth might say that you should stay away from your smartphone, right? That you should not have AI cartoon characters talking to your kids when they're developing. That would be science. Be putting up a wall to say, we only use technology when it's helpful and we eliminate it when it's not helpful to us. If it's better to grow your own food uh, because the food is organic, it gives jobs to people in your community, you're in charge of what you eat, you're self-sufficient and not subject to the whims of multinational and corporations and import, export, uh, logistics firms, then yeah, that's what you should be doing. Uh, technology, by contrast, are processes, technologies, for effect. They can be good, uh, but they can easily be used in a negative way to control people. And as I suggested, they can be used as a means to diminish and to, to uh, um, undermine the capacity of the individual or the community to think independently. And so what's happened over the last 20 years is the smartphone, the internet, the search engine, social media, all these things, which could theoretically be used in a positive sense, have been transformed into covert uh, operations whose primary goal today, sadly, is to, to uh, diminish and undermine, degrade the capacity of the individual to think for herself or himself, to compromise the individual in the community through these relationships with so-called friends who are actually enemies uh, of the uh, ordinary citizen, and through that process to create a economic, social, political environment in the United States, or for that matter, in other countries, in which it is no longer possible to resist the authority above. And critical to that is compromising the individual so that the individual feels somehow he or she is part of this process. And that leads us into things like the wearing of masks. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's, before you go on to, I just want to uh, thank you for that. I just want to say that it, it does seem to me as though because we're moving more and more into technology, it almost seems as though eventually it's going to get to a stage where the technology's community guidelines will be the new law because right. when everyone's on these platforms, they have no choice but to comply to, with them, and especially when it connects to your local supermarket, for instance, you'll sure. be able to get in a loaf of bread without uh, right. uh, you know, complying that's with okay. it. And um, and so that's I, I definitely see that, that is, that's happening. And you're right. I mean, just having conversations like this or the, the general... Uh, scientific line of inquiry just investigating something you'll find that the the technology will character assassinate you delete you ban you 
um, turn you against your friends online. And it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult to know how to, how to play the system, you know, how to beat the system with this. Well, I, I had the experience uh, last week of having 280 videos deleted from Vimeo yeah. uh, suddenly. They decided, I guess I had gotten too popular, I think. Uh, and so they decided to delete me. Uh, and they sent me a letter of explanation. And I, I said, you know, I want to talk to you. I have scientific proof for everything I said. Let's have a dialogue. And they gave me this response to say, these authority figures, whether it's at Harvard or in the American government or uh, in the media, they decide what is true. It's not based on a rigorous questioning through the scientific method, but it's these authority figures. And this is the ideology, which has been, I think, accurately uh, I, uh, described as scienceism. It's not science, but rather this ideology to say that if you're a Harvard professor, if you work at the Center for Disease Control, if you have this stamp of approval, like graduating from a good high school or college, then you have the authority to dictate to the people what is true. And by contrast, if I'm unemployed, right, you know, I'm, I'm, I have, I'm just a blogger or whatever, even if I base everything on a close scientific investigation of things mm -hmm. that I don't have any authority because I don't have that stamp of approval. So that's not science. That's scienceism. Yeah. Scientism. Yeah. Scientism, scientism. Yeah. It's, um, it's a perversion of the actual truth. It's, uh, it's just following orders. It's being compliant. It's the whole, you know, uh, eight out of 10 cats prefer this cat food or 97% of climate scientists have said this. Therefore, trust the science. Anytime you hear, <laughs> anytime you hear trust the science, you know, it's not science. I mean, it's just well, for sure. I mean, know. we see this now. I mean, I read many articles now on policy in the United States in which the first thing they say is that the public supports this. According to our recent surveys, 80% of Americans think that we should do this about health. Now, as an American who has never been called by any, you know, public opinion research polling company, all of which are run for profit and their shares are owned by multinational investment banks, that these are just fabricated. I mean, I wouldn't say that they have no basis in, in uh, reality. I mean, the basic uh, sort of um, propaganda strategy is this basically a 30-70 mix. You take 30% truth, you mix it with 70% lies, and then you plant it in different mouths who have different ideological flavors to them. And this gives the, the impression to everybody that, oh, this is it, it, part of it's true. It must, so the rest must be true. And it's being said by people from the left or from the right, you know, Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump, these cardboard messiahs. So somehow it must be true because it's being recognized, uh, you know, from all these different perspectives. Mm. And we've also seen that with the Twitter files as well. You know, you see the Twitter dump, you know, and it was basically saying that big uh, White House was dictating to big tech Twitter execs and um, they were just making sure that the, the, the company and the algorithms and the AI bots were all filtering out anything that contradicted uh, to the mainstream narr narrative of the WHO, the World Health Organization. Oh. And they were just deplatform and cancel anyone that had any opinions, any alternative uh, views on anything. That's that is scientism, as you call it, isn't it? That is the uh, that's that's the technological uh, monopoly. So, I mean, Twitter is a perfect example. Uh, and the, so the the debate is controlled. Right. It's rather whether, you know, Elon Musk, you know, owning Twitter will somehow make it better or letting Donald Trump and a few of these perverse false messiahs get an account on a Twitter will somehow improve things. But. Twitter is basically uh, a platform for controlling public opinion, which is run for profit and is co-owned by a series of global funds, right? Which they tend to hide behind multinational corporations like you know, BlackRock or Goldman Sachs or Vanguard. But behind those are basically these funds for extremely wealthy individuals and families. 
And so their primary goal there is to control opinion. Uh, and so the all what we really should have had was a debate to say that we don't we don't want Twitter at all. Or, or Twitter should be owned by all its users, right? All the people who use Twitter should be shareholders in Twitter and get a payment back every every week based upon their contribution to Twitter. Uh, but the system is set up in a way that Twitter is owned 100% by these multinational banks, i.e. behind them, wealthy families, and it's used to manipulate us. And we have really no say. I mean, nobody said in this debate on you know, on Trump, on Musk, whatever, nobody said something like, maybe the people who are on Twitter should own Twitter, or maybe they should have a right to determine what the policies are themselves. I don't have, no one suggested that we should be able to propose to Twitter and vote on what Twitter's policies should be. Whoa. So that is the, to, to my mind, the revolutionary change that we need is to say, Facebook, Twitter, social media, they could be positive and they'll be positive when they're owned by their users who after all are the ones con contributing all the value to them, right? We mm -hmm. write for Facebook, Facebook Incorporated uses that information and makes billions of dollars off of it. They pay you nothing. All they do is they give you the special privilege of being able to use it for free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so you mentioned the, the term uh, false messiah. So your opinion on Elon Musk just is just a, a false savior. Um, well, I, I would not rule out the possibility that in the controlled environment in which Elon Musk lives, that he may have more thoughtful views than some of his associates do. So I, I, I I'm not ruling out the possibility that he as an individual may have some positive characteristics. And I have nothing personally against him, but within the larger system of things, this man who is pushing transhumanism and essentially has been a central figure in this effort to push technology, push geofencing and control of the citizen, uh, it has no legitimacy. Uh, and in fact, I would say uh, he should be in jail. I, 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 I think his role in the global takeover uh, over the last four or five years has been central. And he has tens of billions of dollars invested in, and this has been proven, in many of these counter, um, how do I say it, anti-democratic, technological fascist policies. He pushes them through various different holding companies. I, I'm not expert enough on Elon Musk to say exactly how he does it, but I'm quite familiar with the process by which you set up a bunch of sock puppet, puppets to push your agenda from the right and the left. And Elon Musk has been a card-carrying member of this elite group for a long time. How does he so how does he benefit from it though? Speak what what exactly is he is his game? What's his end goal? Well, his his main game, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I'm gonna be brief on this just because I'm yeah. not an expert on yeah. it, but basically he has used public funding to make billions and billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So he comes up with these schemes like we're all gonna go to electric cars. He gets local and central governments around the world to give him tens of billions of dollars to develop and to his Tesla cars, even though they don't even exist, right? Mm -hmm. That he gets all this funding. Uh, and then, and also open AI, I guess, all, similarly, say we have to go to this next stage in terms of our development, and we need all this funding to develop AI. Much of it, which comes from, from our tax dollars or from inflation, from overspending by government. So uh, basically, he's funded by the government, even though he's a a private profit seeking individual. So and and I think he's worse than many people in that respect. The degree to which he was willing to take this enormous amount of money from central governments and central banks to finance these pie in the sky projects like Tesla, which had really nothing. I mean, Tesla is, I mean, I'm sure you've observed this around you, 
these big signs for electric cars, these uh, charging stations that nobody uses, these Tesla cars parked at you know strategically visible locations to sort of publicize that somehow we're going to go to electric cars. But in fact, almost nobody has them, and they're priced out of the range of normal people. And of course, electric cars don't help the environment in most cases, right? It's just a transfer. You're you're taking the pollution and putting it somewhere else and transferring it as electricity, but it's not helping the environment. If anything, you'd be better off going back to riding horses. Yeah, absolutely. It seems to me Elon Musk's role is to get us all on board with him as this renegade that's going into something, you know, for instance, Twitter and like cl and cleaning it out of all the kind of um, the, the, the yeah. fascist liberals, if you like, you know, the ones that <laughs> the ones that are, you know, kicking us all off Twitter. And then we all get behind him and then we will then sympathize with his um, ideas on climate change and building these electric cars, which actually, like you say, they're not actually helping the environment. It all seems to me right. like he's he's a well packaged like a WWF character brought in like a baby yeah. face to make us all, um, you know, buy into some of the things that we might not have been if, you know, it wasn't for him coming in. Well, it's been, a, it's of course, for me, it's been an enormously difficult situation because people now assume that any discussion of, uh, of the destruction of the climate, of the environment is a fraud because it's become fraudulent. Uh, but I personally, based on considerable amount of effort in this in this field, don't think it's a fraud. It's the, the time scale is off. It's not going to lead to human extinction in 20 years, but within 500 years, totally conceivable. And it's not just about carbon dioxide. It's a it's a whole range of destructive activities that is going on from destruction of the seas to microplastics to spread of deserts, the destruction of, of fresh water, et cetera. So it's a complex process. But because so many people have sort of degraded it and made it into a way for banks to control you and you know limit your activities, now, if, if I even just mention the word, say something about environment or climate change, people think, you know, I'm a sock puppet of a of one of those World Economic Forum, you know, people. So it 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 has problematized, maybe intentionally, degraded our ability to even discuss uh, in the environment. Well, you can't have an, again. You can't have really any view that goes outside of the the central narrative. Otherwise, you get called a conspiracy, uh, a climate deni a climate denialist. Absolutely. And it Absolutely. seems to me there's certain things that you can't talk about. Um, which always makes me think, why is that? And it's generally, I find it's be because it's probably the other way around, but I don't want to go too much into that. But that's generally, right. in my experience, what it's been like. The thing, the people that you're you're not allowed to question are the ones that rule over you. I can't remember who said that, Voltaire, I think, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that seems to be the the pattern and the things you can't talk about uh, and the, the things that you, if you have an opinion about um, that are contrary to the mainstream narrative, that's you know you're, you're immediately shut down from that so that makes me think that makes me think well maybe there's something in this well i again i that that's why i think the analogy to incest is so valuable especially when you're talking about intellectuals mm. that in the case of incest in say a family if if like a parent um gets in a fight with a child then people recognize there's a problem in in the family but in in incest there are cases in families where they go on for decades, everyone knowing that something is wrong, nobody being able to talk about it. And the reason is because this incestuous relationship is so compromising to everybody that it's no longer possible to even discuss it. Uh, and, and so it becomes a taboo. And that's basically, I would say, there's like this process, right, from the Kennedy assassination to 9-11 and then on to what we have now, this health crisis, in which uh, an enormous number of intellectuals, so people who are knowledgeable, were so profoundly compromised by these incidents that they were no longer able to uh, express any form of resistance, and they became pawns, essentially, of the system. Yeah, I definitely see that. The Agent Smiths, I call them as well, like from the from the Matrix, whereas we're the Neos. We're sort of bringing that new ideas, the new way of thinking, Neo and the new. Absolutely. Um, just quickly, would you mind just as a spoke from that hub, you know, from the nucleus, would you mind just for a couple of minutes just saying what, what was COVID-19 all about then? 
Right. Well, um, I think COVID-19, uh, probably it goes back in time that there were these efforts to find some way of, of creating mass control and using technology for a sort of global domination. And, and we have, there are parts of some of the DARPA uh, and RAND studies back in the 70s, uh, which have been uh, discussed and some things just declassified, but this, this was going on for a while. Uh, it, and so the idea was a sort of ideological control whereby citizens would no longer be able to articulate an alternative position and would fall into this sort of corporate dominated worldview. And that ultimately that essentially it's creating a new class. Uh, and, and this was aided. I think what led up to COVID-19 was the massive concentration of wealth, which took place in the preceding 10 to 15 years. So if you have the difference between like, you know, a hundred times, like from like average people making 40,000 and rich people being 400,000 or 4 million, that that's, it's a different society than one in which the ordinary people make 60,000 and the rich have a hundred billion, right? It's, it's so different that essentially you get this, this critical gr gap, right? In which you have these super rich group pursuing their interests. And then you have this sort of terrarium economy in which you have the people from working class up to those who hold five to $10 million in assets who are in this little contained bowl. And so this leads to a profound misunderstanding where people think, oh, I have $5 million, I'm rich. But from the perspective of the billionaires, the difference between having $5 million in assets and being homeless is the difference between being an ant and a cockroach. I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing to them. And so a system came into being in which it was possible at the highest levels, these, these Brahmin class, people beyond your reach, to come up with policies that they would enact, which transcended not only local government, but also national governments and even supernatural uh, na national uh, global organizations. And so all of these became essentially run by their pets. Uh, and it was the reason why it's been so hard to conceive of how this small group of people would in engage in policies which are meant to degrade your ability to think basically everybody, 94% of the population, 95% of the population or more, uh, and then also to destroy your bodies, right? To destroy your ability to reproduce, to introduce chemicals that'll cause cancer and other diseases, and that will over time essentially kill you off in the what they call the, the slow kill, um, that most people could not conceive of something like that, partially because it's just so evil. <laughs> people can't conceive of evil, so that, that that's one sort of barrier. But Maybe more importantly was because in our minds, we're thinking that things are being done, you know, by the president or the senator or, you know, the head of our local Lions Club or our mayor or whatever, or the, the rich guy in our neighborhood who's the real estate agent, that somehow we thought these guys are the authority figures. And so when we see that they are like us, right, basically in the same position, then we think, oh, well, they must know what's going on. This must be, it's not in their interest, so obviously they're not going to do it. And so we're unable to conceive that all of these people, all the way up to Joe Biden, right, uh, or Donald Trump, all of them are basically in the same lobster pot that we are, being slowly cooked. And that there's another class of people above that who are totally willing to, to kill all of us, right, <laughs> or turn us into slaves, whatever proportion, you know, fits their latest algorithm, uh, and that they don't care if any of us live or die. And the people we see on TV, for the most part, are, are, are not the people who are making the real decisions. Mm. So this class that you talk about, like that top, even like the top 0.0001%, you know, the right. ones, are, how many are in that, do you think? And who, uh, what kind of, we're talking like the, the billionaire philanthropist right. type, type people, right? Well, the so, Bill Gates. So there is a lot of, there's a lot of debate on this, and I have gotten yeah. into arguments with my fellow travelers about where we cut it off. So there's a book called Giants, which gives 
a analysis of who the major players are in investment banks and other places uh, who have these large amounts of wealth. And I think the analysis is quite good. Um, but there are other versions of this. Uh, and that's where we get into trouble because certain groups will say, well, you know, it's the it's the Zionists, right? Or it's the Rothschilds, or it's the, you know, the Freemasons, mm -hmm. or it's, it's the Vatican. Uh, and so these are all, they're not untrue. <laughs> they're not untrue, but they lack in the scientific clarity and they tend to spill over into a sort of emotional, uh, cultural baggage, which clouds the mind. Uh, and so I, I, I often get into disputes, or I should say, differences of, of opinion with fellow travelers who tend to embrace what I think are slightly oversimplified uh, visions of who's actually making the decision. But my, my position, what I would say the most likely scenario is you have these maybe, I don't know, a couple thousand people uh, who are in these very wealthy families who saw or they got these intelligence reports telling them uh, how much of a crisis we're going to be facing economically and environmentally. Uh, and they embraced this plan to basically create a class society of slaves and, and the super rich with a lot of people who are going to disappear over the next 20 years. And that the actual planning was not made, was not done by the super rich, but rather from this class of advisors, you know, ex uh, military and intelligence officials, not just the US, but from other countries as well, uh, who advised them on how to do this, how to carry out this agenda, and probably uh, wrote up these classified plans. Uh, we know, I mean, I, I got someone forwarded me an email. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, which was from, I think it was from the CIA, but it was a call for uh, Asia experts. And in the uh, advertisement, it said that basically all the positions had been outsourced to Facebook, Cisco, Microsoft, Google, I mean, two or three others. Um, and so basically, all these government organizations are no longer government organizations at all. There's there's no government as a as governing in, in the sense that in an engine you have a governor, right? There's but rather all the parts of government, whether it's in the UK or the United States, or for that matter, in Japan, Germany, China, or Russia, have been outsourced to these for-profit organizations pursuing their own narrow short-term profits. And that is why. We've been rendered blind. The government is government can't do it. The university can't do it. The journalism can't do it. Uh, and so, all uh, uh, we're how would you say it? Um, we're being uh, in in the land. Um, well, I say I say in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. But it's it's worse than that. It's the one-eyed psychopath is king. Mm. That's terrifying when you say it like that. But it's a kind of a bit of a reality check. It's sobering when you say that. But it it totally makes sense. The the people in power that we think are in power are just merely the I don't know, they're just the puppets, aren't they? They're not really they're just the the, the teleprompters that that they're, they're there to give the impression that they're looking after their people, but they're just relaying a message directly from those I don't know, those core companies that you I mentioned. think it's true. I mean, I think yeah. Donald Trump is the best example of that. Yeah. That people had this impression that Donald Trump is sort of like one of the members of this of this sort of elite, but I think that's really not true. That having a million, a couple billion dollars is is not he doesn't count as one of those uh, super elite. Uh, and so uh, this sort of radical divergent. I mean, basically, our minds have not been able to keep up with the radical shifts in our society over the last fifteen years, uh, and that. The COVID-19 crisis is not the cause, but rather the consequence of that, that we got to a point at which the concentration of wealth was so extreme, the control of technology uh, and information had become so extreme that it became possible for the first time that these super elites thought we can just take over everything and just destroy humanity.
if mm -hmm. the gap hadn't been so great, I don't think that that plan, I mean, that plan existed before, but most people would have said back, you know, in, in 2019, Bill Gates and his friends, you know, I don't know, mm -hmm. shooting the breeze at the club, they would have said, you know, nice idea, but you couldn't possibly pull it off. So the question is, why was it in 2019 that suddenly they thought, yeah, we can pull it off. We're going to go for it, you know, extremely risky. I mean, obviously, they're taking a lot of risk, too. I mean, I mean we're at risk, but they're at risk, too. I mean, you know, Bill Gates and friends uh, may not survive this because the risks are so high. But somehow we had gotten to such a place in terms of the collapse of values, the decay of ideology and culture and the concentration of wealth that these people really thought we can pull it off. We can destroy most of humanity following basically the model of the colonization of the new world, which was similar, right? Uh, destroy basically all the, the native populations in, in North and South America, or for that matter, the, the project uh, in the 1940s to destroy, I mean, most people describe it as destroying the, the Jews, which I think is not entirely accurate. It was basically to, because most people who were killed off were Russian POWs, but basically to kill off a very large number of people in, in Russia, Ukraine, Central Europe, and, and throughout Europe, and create this you know, living space, Lebensraum, uh, which would then be settled basically on the American you know, uh, model, right? Destroy the native peoples. And now we find ourselves in a position where we, the ones who thought we were the elites, are now are, are being treated like the, the Navajos or the Iroquois uh, uh, slated for extermination. Mm. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> it's more, and it's not over yet. That's the thing. This is just oh, the start of it, I'm, right? This is I mean, like this is the worse. first. What this is like the first wave of something, and there's like a a swell, and then there'll be another right. wave that comes in. And I I think they they stood back and thought. I can't believe how much the people bought into that. That's what I think right. they're thinking. They're probably having a, a whale of a time thinking, God, they they, they were doing this, the social distancing, <laughs> they're wearing the masks, they were taking the anal swabs, you know, like we could tell them anything and they would do it because they're in a state of hysteria and fear. Um, it well, seems to me like they, they probably can't believe how compliant everyone was. Well, maybe I could say a word about masks, if, if that's okay. Yes, because you mentioned it before, yeah. Yeah, so masks is an extremely important part of this, not because they block viruses, which they don't, but because masks have been used in torture and uh, and uh, sort of re-education for centuries. It's not a new technology. And so by, by creating an environment in which the individual is forced to, by circumstances, to put on this mask voluntarily, it's what's called the rape of the mind, this famous term. So the person is forced into this unnatural violation of her or his sort of conscience and sense of what's right. And by being forced to do that over and over again, loses the capacity to resist. They're profoundly compromised by this action. So the purpose of wearing those masks was that most of the people wearing these masks at some level know that these masks are not scientifically meaningful, but they do it anyway. And so that's a form of mental rape. You continue that pattern until the person, the individual in the community is no longer capable of some sort of organized intellectual resistance. Mm. Yeah, and it also inculcates a state of fear and you know, it, it, it continues in the minds of people. If they're seeing other people with masks, there is still this pandemic going on. Absolutely. So it's it's a visual thing. It's like a, a kind of a, a trickery of the mind to keep people Absolutely. into a certain state. And I definitely, yeah, I definitely see that. Um, yeah, it is rape of the mind. Definitely. I 100% agree with that. Um, and it's like, when did, did the pandemic end? Like, why are people suddenly now taking off their masks? It's because it feels to me that they just took the funding out of a lot of the the channels, you know, the, the funding channels to like the mainstream media. It seems as though they kind right, of, well, you know, that's how it works. They kind of the, the money ran out, and so the, the the people on TV aren't talking about it as much. That's for me what I think probably happened. Well, I, but... I think right now at this moment, we yeah. it's a bit of an interference pattern. On the one hand, there are those at the top with their own strategy who are trying to say, well, we we got all our money out of the pandemic. Let's push forward with the risk of nuclear war or food shortages or destroy banks and money, et cetera. Go into 
plan B, C, and D. Uh, so that's part of it. But there is another part, which is that some people really were organized and there really was the beginning of real resistance. And that also played into it. So we're seeing a sort of combination of the two. So mm -hmm. I would want to conclude not by saying, oh, it's all planned out, but to say that our conversation and, of course, those listening to us, that we're starting to organize a real resistance, mm -hmm. not a bogus cardboard messiah type Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders type uh, uh, effort, but to actually create real sort of flesh and bones uh, opposition in which we start to engage in our own governance, that this conversation mm -hmm. is our meeting, you know, John and Emmanuel speaking. Uh, we have the constitution, we have uh, moral, uh, uh, what we have, justice behind us, we have legitimacy, we are creating our own form of governance that can stand up and say to those who are supposedly in power that we are legitimate, you're not legitimate. And that although we start with nothing, that if we look at history in the past, there have been numerous times in history in which it was possible from starting with a tiny minority uh, who are willing to stick to principles and take risks to flip it so that the whole equation was reversed. Mm. Yeah, a message of hope. I do believe that's possible. A grassroots change rather than a, a top-down, uh, you know, change. That's what we need. Not a great reset. We need a a grassroots, no, sure. a, gra a grassroots reset, if you like. You know, where the people stand up in their individual morality and integrity, and um, you know, they hold they hold governments accountable. That's what we kind of need, isn't it? Would you like to sign off, Emmanuel? Thank you, by the way. Would you like to sign off with? you know, maybe a few closing words and also links to your website and, and your personal projects? Oh, well, so I, I really appreciate everybody joining us today. Uh, I think that our own self-awareness, mindfulness and practice is where we start because if we can identify who we are and separate ourselves from that poison, toxic environment around us, then we can't start this process uh, in a constructive way. Uh, and I would be happy to engage and help all of you. I think we have to assume that the entire system out there for governance, for corporations, for economic interaction is so corrupt that we have to start real alternatives and, uh, and we have to start a debate, a discussion about how we'll do that. Uh, so I, I have my research institute, Asian Institute, which is now shut down the website, so I can't access it, but you can email me obviously directly. Uh, and then I have the campaign where I ran for president and then the, the, the proposal for a provisional government, which is also another website, uh, which I have run.